Hi, my name is Alana, and I am a second year costume student at UAL Wimbledon, specializing in interpretation, particularly for historical garments. And I'm super excited to share my latest project with you today. Now, this is a piece that all second year interpreters had to complete as part of our unit. The basic parameters were to create an 1860s evening bodice with a Bertha collar. I actually wasn't sure what design I was going to choose when I had to start cutting into my fabric. I chose my green silk taffeta because it was one of my favorite colors, and it was a fabric that I had found in the university scrap bin only about a meter and a half off cut, so there wasn't going to be enough for a full ensemble of any sort, but it seemed perfect for this one-off bodice piece. Then by chance, a few weeks later, I was leafing through a book and found an 1860s fashion plate that was in black and white but had the color descriptions at the bottom of the ball gowns, and it noted that one of them was made of a sea green with pink taffeta decorations. And as I was just so excited about finding a bodice by chance that was intended to be made in the exact color I was already using, I felt like it was meant to be. So jumping right into it, we were given a pattern that was specifically used in theatrical settings, so it's not a direct transcription of a pre-existing 1860s bodice pattern. However, I hope you'll agree that the lines are quite serviceable to the era. As with most patterns in the industry, you'll usually get the net pattern of the visible area of the costume, and then you'll have to add your own seam allowance, and if you need extra for a certain kind of opening and closure that you'll be making, you'll have to decide how much extra to put in that part yourself. And so for this bodice, our instructions were that we had to create it with a certain kind of back closure that required two or, two or three inches on each side of the back. And then because it is a theatrical bodice that was meant to be worn without a full set of proper understructures underneath, there's a little bit of extra boning in side pieces that you wouldn't typically see in this bodice if it was made purely for historical purposes. That's also why there are two stiffening layers. One is calico and the other is cotille. And then those are basted and thread marked around the proper seam lines to the top fabric. As you can see, the red are the seam lines and then I used a closer matching color to be the fabric that basted it all together. And after all the layers for each piece were properly basted and thread marked together, it was time to start actually assembling the bodice, and that included piping every single seam, as that was what I wanted to do before I found out about that particular fashion plate, which if you look closely at it, it doesn't have piping on these particular seams. However, it's still a historical technique, and I just love piping, and it is a specialized technique that takes some skill, and so it's very good to have in your portfolio. So that's why I piped all of the seams, curved or straight. It's just honestly a bit of a showing off sort of thing, I would say, and I, I am happy with how it turned out. So I cannot complain. It really isn't quite so much work once you figure out your preferred method of doing it, which mine was to baste the piping to one side of the bodice panel. So then it just acted as one piece instead of having to worry about the piping in between the two other layers. Just sew it onto one side in the exact position it needs to be to line up perfectly with the seam and treat it as one. Then you can cut your seams and press them open. And if you want, you can take out the basting so that you can do one side of the piping on each side of the seam allowance. However, it's not necessary if you have a pretty light top fabric as just one extra layer on one side isn't going to contribute to the bulk quite so much. Now, because this was a university project, we were, as part of the grading and assessment, supposed to have a few different methods of seam finishes within the bodice. So even though historically, it would probably be more likely to choose just one method for the whole thing. We had to do a combination of clipped and overcast and um, bound with bias tape and then also some insertions of channels for boning within some of the seams as well. So that's just why there seems to be a bit of a Frankensteining of techniques here as it was just part of the university project game. However, I will say one of the techniques we were supposed to do was to overlock some of the inside edges and I just 
at the moment I am on a anti-visible overlocking kick. So I will still use it, but if, it, if I know it's going to be visible at the end of the day, it's not going to be covered with something else, I will try to avoid it. Just for now, it's a very frivolous thing. Um, I will get over it very quickly, I promise. However, what you're seeing here is just I decided to do two more boning channels in the center front uh, and bind those over, which wasn't like explicitly what we were told to do within this project. Uh, we were also given the option of using just a thicker boning channel and just doing one straight down the middle. However, I had two four millimeter pieces of synthetic whalebone, so I decided to just do one on each side of the seam. Then there were two other seams, the side seams and then the uh, front side curved bust seams that were used to create boning channels. So the ones that were just straight on the sides, I used some cotton tape to create a boning channel. And then the front seams here, uh, you can see me sticking a bone into, I created a separate channel and then herring boned it to the seam allowance and then placed the boning inside of it. So just Again, a bunch of different methods. And I honestly cannot explain how I didn't think to try this thing on before I piped every single important seam. But I realized that the waist seemed to be about my size. So I decided to try this on, see if I could possibly make a few alterations to the back so that it would fit me. Because um, the thing is, we created the same pattern, everyone who created this bodice, because it was just lifted directly from a pattern cutter for theater who created this specifically to fit an actress. So it wasn't meant to be made to any size, but it does fit me, so huzzah. And now it was time to create the sleeves. Now I used the puff sleeve pattern that came with our instructions for the bodice, and then I just drafted my own overlay that would have that slit in it. Um, according to the fashion plate, the undersleeve part is a netting. So I just have this white netting here. I layered about six pieces in order to create this puff here. And I was originally going to back it with this creamy silk that I found in the scrap bins. However, it turned out to be too sheer with the six layers of netting. And I decided instead of keeping and going with the netting, I was just going to do away with that underlayer. It just didn't seem very necessary in the first place. So I decided to just go ahead with the gathered tool under layers without the lining. However, I was not going to let good scrap bin silk go to waste, so I decided to use it to line the oversleeve portion. So that's what you can see me cutting out here. And it took a bit of piecing for some of the parts, so one of the under layers was cut in one, and this other one here had to be cut in two parts. And then it was sewn together with the oversleeve turned inside out, and pressed kind of to make sure that the green part rolled over the pink part. However, if any of it had been visible, it would have been fine because it's all getting covered in the pink uh, ribbon taffeta. But you can see here, after I had finished it up, I attached it to the top of the netting and then I had to bind the upper edge. And so for the 50th time, even though this is the first time I'm showing you, I had to create some bias binding. And the further along I got in this project, the smaller the pieces of bias binding progressively got. So by the end here, when we were nearing the close, my bias bound pieces were like four or five inches long and I had to keep connecting them and connecting them together. However, it's really an easy process and if you aren't using a bulky fabric, it will not affect the final product at all um, unless you have an issue with a lot of seams on the bias binding in certain areas, which because this sleeve gets pinned into the inside of the bodice, it's not an issue here. And now we finally get to move on to the pink taffeta trimming. So I decided to draw the thread in order to get a really clean edge for the ribbon. Um, in reality, this fashion plate, the ribbon probably would have been just a pre-cut piece of ribbon because then it had to be pleated up and I probably wouldn't have to bother with the raw edges. However, you use what you have, you make do. I had just plain pink taffeta, not pink taffeta ribbon. So I sewed it up together into these little half pleats, half inch pleats, 
And then the idea was going to be to take pinking shears to the edge. And since this is a two-tone taffeta, the edge, once you kind of pulled the fibers out of the pinking, would show that yellow border. However, um, my pinking shears, which were from Ikea and had never been used before, I think they'd been, they'd been around for years, but I had never used them on a project, um, they, they were dull. They were unbelievably dull. They nearly ruined this piece of trim. So we had to postpone doing that until I could get to uni um, to use the equipment there. They have some amazing pinking shears, very sharp, very lovely. So postponed that part of the project and moved on to piping the sleeves, which is the same process as piping everything else in this costume. Do I hate piping with the amount of piping that I did for this project? No, actually, because... I get a power trip out of it because I'm really good at it. But if you don't like piping, do not do this project. Binding the sleeves was particularly tricky just because it's all completely curved and then we had to do this with two ridiculously thick lining layers which ticked me off the entirety of this project. I wish it had just been just one layer of cotille. Cotille is so lovely. Why did we need to do cotille and calico? I know it's because we had to do the... Um, boning channels like on those side seams but still i'll complain about it but all is forgiven because oh my gosh using good sharp pinking shears life-changing do you see how crisp this is not a single ounce of hesitation from those scissors going through three four five layers of taffeta unbelievable a plus gold medal it was it was a pleasure really a pleasure working with them and once I'd finally sorted out a few meters of this pink ribbon, it was time to start basting it to the sleeves and then also the bodice. Now there was a little bit of a uh, tricky portion here because the ribbon decoration on the original fashion plate is not impeded by those side front seams that I piped because it's not piped on the uh, fashion plate. So it was a little bit tricky figuring out exactly where to put them so that it matched the fashion plate well enough, but actually suited the extra barriers that I'd placed on the bodice. However, I think it actually turned out really well. And again, it's just basted, tacked on so that it could theoretically be taken off if the bodice ever needs to be refashioned for a different event. And after adding that decoration, we were in the home stretch and it was time to pipe the bottom edge of the bodice. In order to get a nice crisp point, I snipped up to the very top there of the piped bit and I made sure to baste it in place and use fray check. However, if it if I wanted it to have been even pointier, I think it would have been better to use a much thinner um, bit of piping along the bottom edge. I think that would have definitely helped. But live and learn for next time. I think it still turned out quite shapely. Right, so before I do the top edge, I have to stop and complete the back closure. And so this is the sample that we have. So this is for a different style of bodice, or actually, no, yeah, this is for a different style of bodice, has a much higher neck here. But same principle for the back closure. It just has no extra placket or anything. It's just everything's folded over to create that base for hooks and eyes to go onto. And so, applying that to this one, we need to create the spot here for the hooks and eyes to go, and this is just... The way it's done here is that it's folded over once, and then the edge is surged. However, I am on a kick of not wanting to see any surged edges in any of my work right now, so I'm thinking we'll do the fold over, and then we'll just put a little strip of like bias right here and then we'll fold that over the edge so that it still has the nice, clean, very thin edging there. And however, since I am using, again, a scrap piece, as I've probably said 5,000 times in this video, I don't have enough bias cut here to do the sides of the closing seam and also the top. So I'm trying to save that for the top and use this random bit um, to create the bias. However, of course, this actually isn't cut on the bias, so it's just going to be straight, but considering those are very straight seams on the back closure, that should be absolutely fine. 
I tried to unpick some of this, but whoever did it was having a lot of trouble with the tension on the machine, so it's just a lot more trouble than it's worth to try to save that centimeter of fabric right there. So we're just going to cut it all off. And here you can see me cutting away a lot of the original amount of seam allowance that the bodice had, and that's just from the alteration that I made so that it would fit me properly. Uh, but it was really easy alteration. I'm really grateful for that. It was genuinely just taking out a straight line, then adding the bias binding, flipping it over, and if you noticed the sample, there is a seam line that is just visible from the back from the outside, which I'm not sure how I feel about it, but you know, that's okay. I think it's it looks quite clean. I made sure that it was as clean of a seam line as possible since it's really going to be front and center. And then it was time to do the bottom part of the closure. Uh, and if you didn't know, for the sake of dressers, everything is closed right over left. So that's why this closure is done that way. Um, so that the dresser can always be doing the same movement when closing something. And then after we had finished the closure, it was time to bind the top edge. Now I didn't do any piping on that, I just did regular bias binding, which I attached to the seam allowance of the upper portion, and then flipped it over, had a really solid ironing once I'd made sure it was even on both sides, and then whipped into place which I'm really proud of all the hand sewing I did in this project. It's all really comparatively clean um, and very proud of it. Other than you can see this dimple here. You see this dimple here? This is what happens when you uh, pick up too much fabric when you're doing the slip stitching because when you're stitching the bias binding down, you're trying to stitch it just to the under layer, but I somehow caught like one thread of the top layer, so I had to go back and fix that, which killed me because I thought I was done with the bodice, but got it fixed and then had to start working on the Bertha collar. So what you saw there were just all the different shapes, iterations of the shape that I made, and then once I had the approximate shape, I started working with the pleating, which I had to do kind of a sunray pleat where it started a lot thinner and branched out. Then I took the shape of the collar that I was going for and placed it over the pleats that I made and cut the pleats on a diagonal to see how they would fit into the shape of the uh, desired collar and how that would look on the bodice, which it was a lot of trial and error here. It was a lot of going back and forth between the kind of collar I imagined versus what was possible with the pleats. However, I will say I cut the final collar out on the bias, so the pleats were just so much easier to shape and mold into soft curves when you're doing it on the bias. Um, so I probably could have saved a lot of time if I had chosen a lighter fabric in which to do the mock-ups, but here you can see the pleating and the uh, back piece were all bias cut, and then I used the calico pleating that I made as a mold, and after a lot of zhuzhing, a lot of steaming, this was genuinely hours, hours at the ironing board, I ended up with a really clean and even uh, set of pleats. And then you can see what I'm laying on top here is the sort of under layer, and this is what the um, lace is going to be fixed to, because if you look at the fashion plate, there's that bit of lace that is sandwiched between the two pleats, or I suppose it could have come from the back, however, you know, we're just doing things in the ways that seem natural. So I affixed it to the back piece um, on the inside so that then you can lay the pleated portion on top and it is sandwiched together. And you might be able to see that the whip stitches are unevenly placed, and that's just because I was stitching through the lace, the gaps within the lace, as it was just a bit too tough to stitch straight through. And then I looked at the side seams to figure out where exactly to bind off the edges of the collar. And with that, it was done, and all that was left was to create the little floral bouquet centerpiece for the collar. 
Um, I will note, I did decide to do just a front collar instead of front and back, and that was just due to fabric constraints, um, time constraints, and the fact that you couldn't see the back of the bodice anyway, and it wasn't required. But mostly because this is a silk taffeta of which mm, buying more fabric, it would be minimum 20 pound a meter. So it really wasn't an option. Um, and you can see here, I patchworked together this little disc to be the base on which I applied all the floral details and I found a little bit of interfacing from the scrap bin. I used the leftover pink ribbons that I had to sew together these little florets to be the main flower pieces and then I have this um it's this big bundle of colored velvet swatches that are from an upholstery dead stock I believe and so I just took a few of those squares in the different green shades and cut out these little leaf pieces. I looked into um, how floral leaves were made, however it does require some specific equipment, so I did this just out of cutting with pinking shears these leaf shapes and then I affixed little quote-unquote veins using really small um, cuts of the velvet. And then once I had all the pieces created, it was time to just figure out how to mishmash them together onto the base. And I did this with a mixture of tacking and using fabric glue. So starting with the base, I put all the leaves down to cover the green taffeta. Uh, and then I used the pink florets to set down those main big flowers that are on the fashion plate. And I filled in all the extra spaces with these little flower bundles that I got from this haberdashery shop on Goldhawk Road. And I will say, these bundles on Goldhawk Road will cost you between like two to four pounds each. So be careful, it adds up. I was only planning to spend about five to maybe 10 pounds on these little flower bits, but I ended up spending 18 pounds. It was too much. However, they really are beautiful, and I'm very happy with how they turned out, and they come in little bundles, but you can pull some of the bundles out, and all the wire is really malleable, so I was just able to kind of push and pull the flowers anywhere I wanted. I At the end of this, I came up with this little mound ball explosion of flowers, which color-wise, very pretty, but I did end up kind of going back and fluffing them out, and um, kind of taking away that really circular shape in, form, in favor of a more natural form. And I'm really, truly, fantastically happy with how these turned out. I must say, I, I do believe I nailed the uh, color combinations of these flowers. Very pleased with that. And without further ado, finally, at I think half eight in the evening, I had been kicked out of the costume studio multiple times in the last two weeks trying to finish this bodice as the studios close at 9 p.m. But today was the day. I hope you're as happy with the finished product as I am. Um, I'll include the fashion plate just one more time right here for you to look at while I'm placing this on the mannequin. Now, I did just pin the Bertha collar because I'm not sure if I do manage to get more fabric, I would possibly like to add a back piece. Otherwise, I would just do hook and eye um, on the shoulder seam for it. But all in all, please let me know what you think in the comments if you would like. Maybe even like this video and subscribe if you're interested in seeing more content. It is quite literally my job right now as I'm in university for costume to be creating pieces like this. And I'd love it for you to follow along on the journey. Thank you so much for watching.